Hello. Very good morning to all of you. Uh, so glad to be back in Malaysia. Uh, came back last year after a two-year lockdown in UK. I was teaching online most of the time. Um, but uh, God is good. We praise God that uh, we are back physically, able to meet together. And um, this morning, I want to share something about uh, Paul's journey. Uh, today's topic is Paul's missionary journey, preaching the gospel from Jerusalem to Illyricum. Uh, I wonder how many of you have been Christian for more than 20 years? Raise up your hand. 20 years? Wow, what a group. Huh? Uh, you, have, you have heard of Illyricum before? Do you know what it's all about? <laughs> yep. Um, really, for myself, I've been teaching in you know, the book of Acts. I've been teaching Revelation. I've been teaching Romans and New Testaments. Actually, I don't know much about Illyricum until 2015 when I went to Illyricum. <laughs> don't, don't, then only I realized what is Paul talking about, you know, what he's trying to say, you know, this passage. So, um, let's read together um, Romans chapter 15. Uh, verses uh, 14, 15 onwards. Let's go. One, two, go. And concerning you, my brethren, I myself also am convinced that you yourself are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge and able also to admonish one another. But I have written very boldly to you on some points, so as to remind you again because of the grace that was given to me from God. To be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles, ministering as a priest to the gospel of God, so that my offering of the Gentiles may become acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Therefore, in Christ Jesus, I found reason for boasting in things pertaining to God. For I would not assume to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me, resulting in the obedience of the Gentiles by word and deed. In the power of signs and wonders, in the power of the Spirit, so that from Jerusalem and round about, as far as Illyricum, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. I want to ask you to do something simple, but uh, something a bit special. Can you all stand together? Not me pray, but you pray. You pray for yourself, and you pray for the person next to you, okay? We ask God to move in our hearts because missions starts from God Himself. If you want to do, be part of missions, you must catch hold of the habit of God. Let Him, let God be on it, and let God move in our heart before we talk about missions. Can you do that? Yeah, let's use at least one minute to pray for yourself. Pray for the person next, left and right. Let's open our mouth. And let's pray together. Hallelujah. Lord, we praise you. Hallelujah. Lord, you are God, you are God, you are God, oh Lord. You are God of missions, Lord. Lord, I pray, Heavenly Father, you speak to us, Lord. You open our hearts, Lord. I pray, Lord, you yourself do something great in us, Lord. I pray and touch our heart. So we are willing, we are willing, Lord, to be able to particip participate in missions of the end times that we are in now, Lord. We pray, Heavenly Father. Lord, your Holy Spirit will move, will move among us, Lord. Help us, Lord, to realize that it's the heart of God for us to be involved in missions, not just live for ourselves, but to live for you too, Lord. I praise you, hallelujah. We thank you, Lord, and listen to us, Lord. I pray, Heavenly Father, do something great in our midst, Lord. We praise you, we thank you. Hallelujah, hallelujah, we praise you, hallelujah. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, because you love us so much, Lord. And because of that, you sent Christ Jesus, your Son, to, be, to save us. Lord, and your, Lord Jesus, you are the greatest missionary of all, Lord. Able to humble yourself and come from heaven and able to reach out to us, Lord. Lord, and giving up everything that you enjoy, Lord, but to be, so that we will be blessed at the end. Heavenly Father, I pray this morning, Lord, that you, you reach out to us again, Lord. As our hearts are open, Lord, you use the Holy Spirit to touch our heart and mind, able to understand what is meant by mission, understand the love of God for us, Lord, so that we will be moved, 
we'll be able to participate in a very privileged mission in the end time era that we're in, Lord. We thank you for your presence. We thank you for all the prayers, Lord. We thank you for all the people around us who keep us in prayers and uphold us in their prayers as well. We thank you. All these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Hello. Hello. Yep. Um, I believe many of us have known, you know, Paul, you know, a, a very important person. Uh, he had reached out to so many Gentiles and uh, helped them to come to the knowledge of God, you know, so fantastically. And uh, I believe that missions start with God and uh, because He Himself, God Himself is a mission of God. You know, he, he's a, he's, he's a, the habit of God is to reach out to us. So something we talk about mission, we thought that is we are giving a lot to God. Actually, it's God Himself giving His whole blessing, all His privileges and blessing to us. So I believe that the Paul must have a very special calling in his life before he went into mission. Uh, we know that uh, in Acts chapter 9, he said here, as he was traveling, it happened that he was approaching Damascus and suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. Uh, we know that Paul was a, 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 you know, a, a hardcore, um, said, uh, these Pharisees, yeah, and he wouldn't want to, you know, to do anything with Christianity. In, in fact, he was a persecutor, you know, persecuted the church and then was on his way, actually, on the road to Damascus and uh, trying to do something, you know, to, in a way, we're doing cross-cultural mission, he's doing cross-cultural so-called persecution, you know. Go to another country, so another province outside Judea to persecute the church. And, um, and because of that, on the road, on the road to Damascus, uh, Paul met up with the resurrected Christ Jesus. He never thought that he would met Christ. Never thought, you know. He thought he was dead, crucified. How come the dead Christ is now the resurrected? So this is the road to Damascus. Uh, how many of you have been to Damascus before? One, uh, two, not too many? Yeah, not too popular a place to go, right? But this is the road to Damascus. I do not know at which point of this road that Paul met with, you know, the resurrected Christ. But anyway, when Paul met with Christ, he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It's funny, isn't it, right? I believe that Paul never persecuted Jesus, you know, directly. Never, right? He persecuted his disciples, isn't it? But Jesus said, Why are you persecuting me? You know, in a direct way. Why? Because Christ recognized that his church is his body. Whenever you persecute the body, you're persecuting me. It's the same thing. So, my friends, when they're in suffering, don't just say, God, where are you? Lord, where are you? <laughs> he suffered with you. Amen? Not abandon you, but suffer along with you because we are His body. I believe because of that, uh, Paul understands what it means by what John chapter 11, verse 25 says, I am the resurrection and the life, and he who believes in me will live even if he dies. He understands that. This is a very special encounter with Jesus that changed his course of life, that changed his mission, that changed his desire to live and purpose of life. My dear friends, all of us need to walk along our own road of Damascus. Amen? It's, it's when... It's, it's when we met Christ, that's how our life will be transformed dramatically. Every one of us need an encounter in whatever level it is. We need an encounter with Christ. Not just a knowledge of Christ, but an, a real experience encountering Christ. And because of that, I believe that Paul, now he can say is that more than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord for whom I have suffered for the loss of all things and count them as rubbish so that I may gain Christ. 
It's not easy to look at things on earth as nothing or just rubbish. It's not easy, right? Chinese, hello? Indians? It's not easy, right? Come on, my Mercedes Benz, my bungalow, my everything, you know, count as lost. You know, this is rubbish. No way. But when compared with the grace of God, when compared with the salvation of God, in the light of His salvation, in light of His grace, compared with it, the rest, whatever things that we gain on earth is nothing. This is Paul's conviction. I believe that this has helped him to walk a lot of rough way along his ministry in spite of all the difficulties in life until death, he was faithful till the end. Amen? So the call of God in our life is important. No matter it's to a full-time ministry or whatever, the call of God in your life can be a professional businessman, a dentist, a doctor, a lawyer, whatever. It's okay. But as long that you know that you're walking along the call of God. Of course, some of us, very few of us, will have the experience of like what Paul has have gone through. Well, Paul is a bit far away because he's a, 2000, a figure, a historical figure 2,000 years ago. But just to mention somebody close to us. Um, I was, uh, all my life, I've called that, you know, that I've been ministering to the Chinese-speaking congregation. And uh, I've been actively involved in China ministry in the past. Uh, I even uh, re- you know, published a book about the China pastor's testimony. There are a lot of amazing stories that happen in China, you know. But you must read Mandarin to understand what I'm talking about. <laughs> well, uh, I met up recently with the Tibetan monk. Uh, this is somebody, in- somebody interesting. Um, he stays in Shangri-La. Not Shangri-La Hotel, okay? Shangri-La Yunnan in China, okay? Makes a lot of difference, right? And uh, uh, we, I even let uh, we shot the mission team to China to, to help the China university students and, and young people to their mission camp. And after that, we go for shorter missions, you know, to reach out to uh, to, the, to to Chinese uh, minority or Chinese, whatever. So uh, so we were there, you know, visiting his hometown. So he he shared with us, he shared with us his experience. This Tibetan monk, I don't want to show his face because he's sensitive. Uh, since he was always a recipient of the Top Student Award among 3,000 monks, he was later appointed as a teacher for the younger monks. So he's a very intelligent person, you can see that. And this they made him a teacher because he was so good, so intelligent, he knew a few languages, and he became a, quite a famous teacher, and he has seven to, 700 to 800 students, all monks, you know. You can see how staunch, you know, he was at that time. And uh, because of that, uh, he was famous. And then his villagers liked him a lot, put, put his photo on the, on the wall, you know, just like idol, you know, whatever, you know, pop idol, whatever. Um, and, but something happened along the line. After serving for 15 years, uh, yeah, he found that he, uh, suddenly his, his brain got haywire, you know. He couldn't, he couldn't preach well, couldn't say things well, and the student couldn't communicate well with him. Something wrong somewhere. He, he was so distraught that he's so sad and he left the, the, his, his old training ground and left, uh, don't want to be a full-time monk anymore and he went back home straight, very sadly. You know? But he was, when, he, when he was back in his hometown, he was not welcomed at all by his own villagers. Why? He's pop idol, you know. And now no more idol, you know. And he taught, he, they tore out his photo from the, from the wall. Yeah, you're no more our idol anymore. Now you became not, not a monk anymore. You know, what are you doing? You know, what are you doing with life? Yeah. Of course, that made him more disappointed and he decided to commit suicide in a nearby river. Dramatic, you know, Did he go? Yes, he did. He did go to the riverside and in the wee hours, well, he, was, he told us directly, you know, one hand was holding the railing and one foot was in the river, you know. He, he just hold on for the next one, two minutes to decide to jump or not to jump. Wow. What happened? Suddenly, he hear a voice from the sky. A voice spoke to him. Not in his own Tibetan language, but in English. What on earth? His all villagers do not know, nobody understands English. For sure, he knows English, 
but the rest of his family, for sure, they do not know English. And the voice from heaven say, what are you doing? What did he see? He saw a, a figure wearing in white rope uh, in heaven, uh, in the sky. He was rubbing his eye four, five, six times to see whether it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a you know, a blurry vision or whatever thing. But he still saw the figure then. Because before that, he was studying the Bible to attack the Bible, you know, attack the Christians. Yeah? And he knows that this is Christ Jesus. And now he's no more Tibetan monk. He's a Tibetan pastor. Amen? He has been pastor for the, the, close to 20 years now, because of a few years back, and has brought as many as 200 Tibetans to Christ. Amen? <laughs> Hallelujah. So I was with him in Shangri-La. We were having lunch together there. Yeah, uh, this was his a very, very special kind of, you know, divine kind of experience I had never heard before. We know that Tibetans are not easy to come to Christ, right? Not easy. I think uh, he was given a special privilege uh, to, to experience God himself because he's a, really a hardcore, <laughs> a hardcore like Paul. And actually, he, he called himself Paul, in a sense, as a reflection of how two hundred years ago, there's a very hardcore Paul that God converted, and now he himself was converted by Christ himself. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. Really, you know, um, I believe that God gives grace, special grace to certain few people because God has a calling for them. Do you want to have a special vision? Anybody? Anybody wants? Uh, don't, don't cry for it. Don't, don't urge for it, desire for it because the more that is given, the more is <laughs> required. I'm sorry to say that. Yeah? God is fair, right? Not, right? God is fair, you know. And for myself too, I have a special experience too in my teens, you know. I was sleeping on the bed, you know, about, I was 15, 16, I forgot, you know. I was, I was awakened from my bed and I oh, continued to sleep and then, you know. You know, I was in a way, uh, just about three, five minutes, not even less than that, you know. I was seeing the pitch dark and whatever. And suddenly the, the pitch dark, you know, become, you know, open up, you know. And, and an angel, you know, descended from heaven. So sudden, you know. And then uh, open the ancient scroll to me and pronounce a statement to me. I got a shock of my life. I jump off my bed. I go to the toilet. What is happening? <laughs> well, uh, I didn't ask for it for sure, you know. And um, but that helps me to prepare myself, you know, to go to full time ministry as the time passed by because I believe that God has a special call for me, you know. Uh, um, to, to do his ministry, you know. Uh, although I got a first-class honors from using Malaya Engineering, you know, but uh, God has given me a special privilege to, to know his will, that I, I'm willing to give up everything, you know, for him. Because God has a call for me. Because, I, because probably I need that, you know, to, to fully give up what I, what I can earn on, on, earth, on earth. And I believe that God has same, you know, kind of, calling for everyone, but different kind of revelation to everyone. But he has the same way, same will, desire that all of you should know God better, deeper. Amen? That is his will. Yeah? So we thank God for that, for God's intervention in our life. So let's talk about Paul's long distance journey to Illyricum. Uh, Illyricum is a very ancient word, actually. Uh, it's, it's the, uh, you don't, uh, you don't, Hello, yeah. <laughs> yep. You don't really find it uh, uh, common in uh, today's uh, book. But in Romans chapter 15, verse 19 says that uh, in the power of signs and wonders, in the power of the Spirit, so, so that from Jerusalem and round about as far as Illyricum, I fully preached the gospel of Christ. What he's trying to say, actually. When Paul wrote the, the epistle of Romans, he has, not, he has not been to Rome before. This is something like 80, 56, 57, when he shared about this thing. He was about to go to Rome and about to go to Spain, actually. And he wrote this epistle, and he says that 
so that from Jerusalem and around as far, about as far as Illyricum, he's trying to say that I've been traveling a long journey from Jerusalem all the way to the very far edge of his journey to a, a very far region called Illyricum, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. He has tried his very best. Our dear friends, have you tried your best? So, where is it? When did it happen? I believe that this happens during the Paul's uh, third missionary trip that he went to the northern part of Greece to go to Illyricum, which is the northern part of Greece. So it's, it's recorded in Acts 19, verse 1, say, it happened that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul passed through the upper country and came to Ephesus and found some disciples. This is the only place that is recorded that Paul went up to the northern part of Greece, okay, upper part, okay, the upper country, and came down to the south. This is the only place, okay? So this happened something around uh, the third mission of Christ is around in the mid 50s, okay, 54, 55, around that, around that. And I was sitting by the harbor of Thessaloniki, uh, not Port Klang, huh? okay. <laughs> and um, I, 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 I pondered a lot of things. Uh, Paul came all the way to Thessaloniki. You know, he, he came to say, why, why? Because he was given a Simon. It's something he's not ready to do at the time. Why? He was given a Macedonian vision. And that's why he came to St. Luke. That's why he went to Philippi. Why? Because the Macedonian stays in that area. The two specific big city of Macedonians resided, the two big major cities. One is the north, Philippi, and the second in the south is Thessaloniki. Who are those Macedonians? So beside this harbour, beside harbour, the statue of Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great was a Macedonian king. His tribe, all his tribe were, were Macedonian. And I even went to his hometown, which is about one and a half hours drive from Thessaloniki, all the way uh, to the, his hometown. It's called Pela, his hometown. And his uh, military base actually was quite near uh, Thessaloniki, actually. So, so for Paul to go to, to Illyricum, there's a way, actually. There's a highway linking Philippi all the way to Thessaloniki or, and then to the west to Illyricum. There's a highway, okay? So this highway will link up at the end, will reach this place called Illyricum, okay? This is the region, the province of Illyricum. So Illyricum was established before, uh, uh, in, the, in the BC, okay, in uh, existence between 167 BC and 10 AD, there's a Roman province. And it was an important western part of the northern part of Greece, which is today's Albania. How many of you have been to Albania before? Wow, one at least, okay, not too bad, okay. So the um, ancient time, um, Illyricum was today, is today's. Um, um, Albania. So, I was standing just in front of the main gate of uh, Thessaloniki. I believe that Paul must have entered into this city. You know, there's a highway linking Philippi to Thessaloniki, Thessaloniki to Illyricum. So, he must be entering straight through this gate. So, you can see that on the left corner here, there's, there's, a, there's a, a road sign um, which is attached the, along the building on the sideway. Uh, it's called Ignatia. Ignatia, okay? So this is the Ignatia. Can you read that at the bottom? Ignatia. This is the name, the highway, they call Ignatia during Paul's time, okay? And he was traveling along this highway, and today it is also called Ignatia. So we are re, in a way, walking, you know, journeying along the way what Paul has gone before. So as you go through the highway, you can see a lot of, you know, signboard. You can see that Ignatia Odos. Odos in Greek means away. And there's a lot of bricks, you know, that engrafted this name Ignatia, right? Uh, you can see that my wife is, uh, is pointing, uh, one of the blocks uh, where have this name called Ignatia. And you know that uh, in the past, that uh, 
uh, highways are important for the Romans, right? They built very good roads, okay? Not for you, for me to travel, but for the military, for their, for their people to, to, to move from place to place to fight the enemies. And mind you, you know, the, the average width of a highway is 20 feet. <laughs> Wonder why, eh? so, so, you know, so narrow. You don't need that, that white, just, you know, uh, for the horse to, to, horses to go around. You don't need that, that, that kind of uh, white uh, highway. And today, you can still find these ancient Roman roads uh, still there around it, you know. I wonder, our Malaysian road, how, how long can last our roads? Huh? <laughs> it's 2,000 years till now, it's still there, you know. And it still can be, can be, can be used until 1850. You can see that? How good is the road can be used until like near 2,000 years to now? I mean, utilize that. The problem is, the problem is for Paul to travel from Thessaloniki to Illyricum, as you go westward, as you go westward, it's a problem. Why? It's very mountainous, okay? You can sense that, wow, the challenge is there. Uh, for now, uh, every year since 2015, I've been to uh, Illyricum, Albania, and uh, Serbia, all this area, because our ministry among the gypsies. So every time when we travel from Albania to Thessaloniki in the reverse direction, for eight hours in the coach, I, feel, I still feel uneasy, you know, because we are going through winding path today, you know. And, uh, and, and the way is the, not as easy. Of course, you can see there's some ways, I mean, more flat now, with tar road. And also, you can see that uh, there are tunnels, you know, they have been done already. We don't need to go round, round, you know, mountains for hours. We just use three minutes, just bridge through because it's been done. Some of the, some of the ancient uh, highway have been replaced by today's way. You can see that? But, but still, every year we need to go through this way for one time, you know. This is a must, you know. Every year, we need to pass by this wine road at least for 20 minutes, like that, yeah, okay? Irreplaceable. And along the way, Paul must have, you know, uh, able to uh, reach a lake, which is, I, I consider, one of the most beautiful lakes around. I wonder if you like lake or not, okay? Look at this. Do you think this lake is beautiful? Yeah, nice. So every time we have our short mission, surely we'll put a night beside the lake, okay? I'll put a hotel there, and uh, living cost in Albania is not expensive. It only costs us 15 euro per night, okay? Plus free breakfast. Come on, join me. I'm going next. I'm going next month. So I was standing beside the lake, right? Wow, amazing! Yeah, Paul must have somehow probably he stood there before, right? He passed by this lake, and probably he must be hungry, right? And in Galilee, there's a St. Peter's fish. I call it St. Paul's fish. <laughs> so every night that we reach at night time, our dinner, this is our main dish, okay? I call it, let's eat St. Paul's fish, okay? My copyright, huh? <laughs> and uh, as, we, as we go down the, the, the way, you know, it's still very mountainous, I see that. Uh, so we reach a city called Albasan. Uh, Albasan is uh, in the middle of the journey uh, where you can see the ancient walls, you can see that, and also some ancient castle and uh, lots of Roman roads still available. You can see that? This is the Roman roads, which is, can be a witness that the Romans you know, built this city and uh, along this highway. And along Albasan, as you go deeper to the west, you, you surely need to pass by a bridge. The local calls it St. Paul's Bridge. Why? Paul must have traveled along this bridge, must cross this bridge to go to the ancient city of Illyricum, which is to rest today. So the local call it St. Paul's Bridge. It's not my invention. Huh? And the, but the beautiful thing is that every time we go to this bridge or visit this bridge and walk along it, um, we are very fascinated because at the bottom of the bridge there are a lot of stones, you know? And... Uh, and the stones have a lot of crosses, natural, you know, crosses, not, not written, not drawn, but natural. Small or big, they surely can find some stone with crosses. How many interested for free? 
bring a few samples back home for display. It's fantastic, right? So whenever we reach there, our team members are so excited, uh, and they'll what we do? They'll jump up and down. <laughs> I, I, I always remind them, please, and warn them, there's no railing, you know. Jump up and down, you drop down in the river, not my problem, uh, your issue, uh, okay? So they're excited because why? We are like re, you know, rewinding Paul's journey, and, and as Paul walked to the, the, across the bridge, we also like Paul like that, you know, cross the border bridge, you know, and, and try to feel how Paul felt, you know, many years ago as he traveled along this way. So for us, is that as you reach, as you reach Albania, uh, 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 this is a country that we, if met, not many of us are interested to go. Uh, Albania is a Muslim country, and um, as I said, uh, it's, it's uh, uh, not a popular uh, tourist uh, um, attraction there. But when you reach there, surprisingly, the locals, these are locals, were swarmers, you know, because it seems that they've never seen Chinese before. <laughs> We're like zoo, yeah? Wow, the Chinese are coming, you know? Mm. So they are, they are so excited to see for the first time, like we last time see the Mastale for the first time like that, you know, and take picture with us. Of course, it's a secular country. Um, the people there like pork and like drink and whatever. <laughs> and so very different, anyway. But in terms of gospel, you can still share, and you know, people there, it's not a problem, not, not in the other like countries. So right in the city of Dures, this ancient city of Illyricum, I was pointing, you see that? You can see that I was pointing a sign, which is called Ignasha. Okay, this is the one, right? Eh? You see that? So that means... Uh, this highway had been there 2,000 years till now, you know? It's so amazing right now. You go to a place that the name that Thessaloniki had been there for 2,000 years, still, still Thessaloniki like that, right? And the, and the highway is still the same, you know, with the same name. It's so amazing. But the problem is, for Paul to, to, to walk this path, the distance between Thessaloniki and Illyricum is 430 kilometers. Do you think it's far? For us today, 430 kilometers is like Kuala Lumpur to Alu Star, something like that, right? So for us to drive straight, you know, for a few hours, seven, six hours, you know, which is quite easy. But during Paul's time, there's no aeroplane, there's no car, not even bicycle, by the way. So Paul needed to walk along this way, 430 kilometers and by the way, it's not all flat land. As you go halfway, up and down, up and down, up and down. If one day you can travel 20 to 25 kilometers walking, 20 to 25 kilometers, you are fantastic. For the hilly area, if you can walk 15 kilometers, hilly kilometer, one day, you are super fantastic. Paul must have walked for weeks, actually, this path to go to Thessaloniki. So, uh, in my mind, uh, I, I believe that most of us have uh, traveled, huh? but, uh, but not, many has, not many of us have walked that far. Um, we have a lot of challenges. Just, just wanna, for the test today, how many of us, how many of us, you have walked from your home to the church, not 430 kilometers, but 0 0.4, 400 meters away from a house, to the church or from a place. How many of you? Walk for 400 meters? Okay, good clap for him. Right, come on. <laughs> I've tested in many places. Moses only walked within 40 meters. Am I right? Did say that? Open the car door, the church is just in front. In front. We, we won't go to the church that requires us to walk more than 400 meters. Come on, take a taxi. Come on. So, uh, for us, uh, how, how difficult is it to walk a long journey is difficult to understand. Yeah, for, for example, let's read uh, what Paul's written in 2 Corinthians. Are they servants of Christ? I speak oh, as if insane, I'm more so. In, in, in far, more labors. In, in far, more imprisonments. Beaten times without numbers. Often in dangers of death. Five times I received from the Jews 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. One I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I have spent in the deep. This is a summary of Paul's long journey missionary trips. You know, 
journey long distance in the past has not been easy and very risky compared with what we Paul have, you know, had in the previous years. Now, for us to travel long distance is comparatively very easy. Am I right to say that? Even for, for, for long distance uh, flights, uh, it can be so cheap nowadays. For example, I was from London, traveling, uh, flying from London to Norway, Oslo. Only, only cost me £4.99. Three hours flight. Don't ask me why, okay? <laughs> Well, some of you have experienced zero A-Asia flight. Come on, fees, right? Only the uh, airport charges will do. So, f- for us, flying or uh, traveling long distance is not as difficult as before. Huh? We do have that kind of problem that Paul has did, had involved with. And later on, uh, he says that, um, I've been on frequent, frequent journeys. This journey, of course were the long-distance journey in dangers of rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my countrymen, dangers from the Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers on the sea, dangers among false brethren. Wow, there's so many, a long list of dangers. I wonder, you know, do they have insurance company last time? If they do have, then, then Paul won't be entitled actually, yeah? because he's a high-risk person. Nobody will sell his policy to them. And of course, I have been in labor and hardship through many sleepless nights, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. Apart from such external things, there is daily pressure on me a concern for all the churches. I think this is a real life story, isn't it, right? You know, something that Paul imagined. It's something that he had been, he'd been through, he experienced himself. You know, not somebody else's experience, but his own experience. I have been in labor and hardship. What does it mean? Sleepless nights. Did Paul get a chance to do B&B online like that? Book a hotel, you know, along the way? Too bad? No Wi-Fi. <laughs> in hunger and thirst, you know, during this time, you know, if I, if I, I'm, I'm, going, I'm going in November, you know, to Albania again. We are traveling from Albania. It took us, uh, usually, uh, previous years, for eight hours travel along the way, you know, now. Huh? And, and, and even now, as we're traveling all the winding path and, uh, you know, winding, you know, hill, hilly ways, there's only one service station. I don't know why. One service station, you know, we, 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 we drop by there for a little while, a cup of coffee. It's called Turkish coffee, you know. There's... So horrible. <laughs> don't ever buy. Uh, save your money. <laughs> so during our first trip, we don't know. We don't know. We thought service saying a lot of things to, to buy. We thought. So at the end, only Turkish coffee. Only, uh, what is that all about? So we are in hunger in a coach. <laughs> oh, well, come on. You know. But the second year, we are fully prepared. A lot of buffet in our coach. <laughs> all the hamburgers. The bread. <laughs> what I mean is that Paul must have gone through this way without his... You know, didn't, didn't know, didn't know that there are no service station, no hotel, no motel, no one, there's nothing there, you know? Any KFC around the time? McDonald's? You know? Fast food? You have all the money in the world, you can't buy even a, a simple meal. Nobody sells to you, by the way. It's such a winding and cold area. Uh, you travel there, there's, there, in December, for example, in January, there, there's, there, there's, there's some snow. It can go as long as low as minus fifteen. You know, so I have been showing the the lake scenery, which is very beautiful in the winter. Beautiful in the sense of what, like frozen icy kind of thing. You know, uh, photo very nice. Okay, but don't be in it; you'll be frozen. Nice to see, but not nice to taste. You know, experience inside the photo. So this is Paul's experience. We'll go for a long journey. Of course, Paul couldn't have all the opportunity to bring all kinds of food at the back, right? To walk for weeks. You can't. You can't do that. Usually, they prepare about a few days of food, a few days of drink. That's the most easier thing to do because you're walking all the way. You can't afford to have weeks of bread and weeks of biscuits and weeks of water. No way. So, along the way, you'll collect. Along the way, you'll buy. Along the way, you find the help. 
But some, along, somewhere along the way, there's nobody selling to you. Nobody help you. There's nobody there. So you need to sleep by the river, by the cave, under, under the trees, and things like that. Anyway, Paul at the end reached this city called Jures. Uh, Jures was the ancient city of Illyricum. Okay? It's, it was a very famous place because uh, it was uh, originated, established um, in the 7th century BC. And by the 5th century BC, it was already a renowned harbor. Why is it important? And why the, 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 the uh, emperors, why the military commandos, they want to fight over this place? Because this is the inlet. This is the entry point to the east by, by land. From the west, you can bring your, your, your food stuff, your, your, your good stuff, you know, and then um, entering to duress. And from there, you can bring the, the goods to Thessaloniki from Philippi all the way to Istanbul and to the east. So similarly, if your goods are from uh, the east, you can bring to Duras and take a, a short distance uh, voyage to Italy, to Bari, and from there you can bring all the, the, your food stuff to Rome. Why all the hustles? Why? Because in ancient time, traveling by ship, by voyage, is easy, okay? Direct, but there are winds, strong winds, and in, you know, your, your ship can easily capsize and you can lose you know, you can lose everything. So if a businessman, which route you take? Land or sea? <laughs> so probably you take by land, right? You know, then everything is lost, it's gone, you're bankrupt already. So quite a lot of people use land, you know, way to ship things from the east or to the west. So actually, you can see that this is a long, long journey from uh, east to the west. In the way, in a way, Paul's journey to the west like this, actually, is part of an ancient road called Silk Road. Silk Road have a few, you know, direction. One is the sea from from um, uh, from uh, Palestine. You have some harbor there. You can go by ship, you know, to go to Rome. And some other area is go by land again, an upper upper area. So Paul actually he had, he had been to uh, using the 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 upper upper layer and upper, you know, uh, land, uh, roads in, in, the, in the northern part of Greece. And Silk Road was very famous 2,000 years ago. Why? I believe that God loves the people in the East. He loves the people of India. He loves the people in Chi the Chinese in the East. And that's why he formed a Silk Road along it. And Antioch was the western, you know, most important city along the Silk Road by land. And mind you, the, Ant the church in Antioch, they were the catalyst in motivating people to evangelize to people in the East. The church in Antioch not only sent Paul and Barnabas to the West, they also sent people to the East. And some of them end up in Iraq, northern Mesopotamia, Persia, and they end they end up in India in the first century and end up in China at least the second century. Praise the Lord. God is very wise, isn't it? He raised up Antioch to be a very mission-minded church so they can bless the world, not just to the West and not forgetting, hello, Chinese in the East. In the East. God is so good. Can you see that? Amen? Praise the Lord. So in Duress itself, uh, there, are, there, are, there are records how the church went through persecution, uh, not an easy uh, uh, um, experience, and even the bishop was uh, executed in AD 100. And, uh, uh, and to rest, uh, it's an important city. Paul knows that, uh, Paul knew that this city must be evangelized. We must set up a church quickly because it's a very important city, important harbor of Albania today. Uh, what amazes, amazes me is that when I first reached there for the first year, I went to the museum in Albania, and I got shocked on my life. Why? This so-called with M background country recorded, you know, the, the earliest church, how the early church was formed, you know, and recorded down in their museum. I wonder why. But praise God, it's still there. So, you go with me, you go to this museum, 
It is stated clearly in AD 58, a Christian community consisting of 70 families live in Duchacham, which is the rest, according to historical record. 58, the first church was established. Amen? And who went there? The local you know, museum didn't tell us. But Paul he has written, you know, the Epistle of the Romans in 56, 57, you know, and he told us he has been to Illyricum. He went there. And later on, without his knowledge, I think, the church was formed, established in duress in AD 58. Give God a big applause. Hallelujah. So all together, the Apostle Paul has probably traveled more than 10,000 miles to share the love of Christ. This part of the region is very difficult to go. But yet, Paul said, as far as Illyricum from Jerusalem, as far as Illyricum, I've been there and shared the gospel of Christ. That's what he's trying to, say, trying to share with us. It was difficult. It was not easy. It was long. It was difficult. Yet, I still went there. Amen? This is Paul. And uh, why I share with you uh, this message? Because as we go through history, today there's a mission opportunity in Illyricum. Uh, who are they now? So they are the gypsies. Uh, I wonder you know about gypsy. How many of you have met a gypsy in your life before? At least once? Not too many, yeah? Gypsies are not so popular in Malaysia, okay? Yep. But gypsies, you know, they are all over Europe. Uh, according to history, gypsies are from northern India. They are like the Dalit yeah, in India. And they moved to the west to find a better life. Yet, they couldn't find it. And then they found a lot of problem and persecution. And mind you, you would never know. You thought that Hitler only persecuted and killed 6 million Jews. Only, you thought. This is the only race that Hitler persecuted. No. He persecuted the Jews and the gypsies along them, okay? At the same time. And how many of them was uh, persecuted? Yeah, be surprised. You can see the children. You can see the 800 gypsy children were killed in the, in the camp. And altogether estimated there are about uh, uh, 500,000 gypsies that were killed by the Nazis. Can you, can you, see, can you, see, the, uh, can you see those shoes, you know, down there? Why? Why those shoes left behind? Because they are pushed and thrown into the river and left behind all these shoes. Okay, this is a testimony what they have done to them. And uh, unlike the Jews, uh, who are quite well-versed in education, things like that, the gypsy is still very low in terms of profile. You know? And uh, usually they stay in areas without electricity, without water, all these places, those remote areas. For them to go to school, to walk to school, something like one and a half hours. Okay? So you can be sure the children won't go to school because it's so impossible to go to school. One and a half hours walking, going to go, you know. So what happened is that the uh, missionaries set up education centre in their community. Yeah, here are some of the story. you know. This is one of the pastors from Bulgaria, a gypsy pastor. He was sharing with us in Hungary in 2015. Uh, as he shared with us, he cried, you know, in front of us, you know. Why? He, he, the, the trauma is still there, you know. He said that when, when I was young, uh, I, I'm being bullied, you know. Who? Who bullied him? Where? In school. And who bullied him? The teacher. The teacher bullied me, he said. The teacher will put me at the back row, and from there onwards, you are like invisible to the teacher. Whatever you ask is invisible. You are just like an outcast, isolated person. There are some gypsies in school, after six years education, still illiterate. Can you imagine that? Six years primary school? This is what they'll do to them, okay? And surprisingly, uh, this Hungarian pastor, he had a heart for gypsy and brought a few dozen gypsy to Christ and bring them to his own Hungarian church. And the church turned them out. They're not willing to let gypsy come to their so-called holy church, you know. And gypsy families having difficulties because they can't find job. Gypsies are labored. Once you are recognized as a gypsy, you are considered as a thief, a burglar. Is it fair? Is it fair? If you are a gypsy, you are considered as 
a thief. Nothing more than a thief. The company, whatever company, whatever, whatever shops, they won't employ you. No matter how good you are, even if you have a university degree, also they won't employ you. So unless you have your own, uh, you have your own, uh, you have your own uh, uh, this um, fun to start your own store and things like that. Yeah. So you can see that uh, this is. Uh, uh, Pastor, can I get extra five minutes for that? <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah. So they need to, we need to set up a greenhouse for them. And then uh, you can see this old cloth used what to burn for winter because there's no money for this tea and for, for, for coal. And uh, these families are without a father because father is in prison, without food, they still and got in prison and, uh, and, and the family got in trouble. This uh, pastors was, servant pastor was supplying food to them twice a week. And uh, gypsy families, you know, they like Jackie Chan's movie. So whenever I'm there, I'm always like that. I like to do that, and I look like... <laughs> Hello? I look like what? <laughs> so I have a fun time with them, because they like Chinese movie, Kung Fu movie, and they like Jackie Chan, and it's not a blessing I look like him, you know? <laughs> and I have a fun time with them. They like me, in a way. So when I, when I go to Duress, for example, I landed in this place, and, um, and these five children, teenagers, come, just come to me, you know, and we have a selfie. I told them in English, similar English, one hour, one hour, you come, 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 okay? We do some presentation to you. These five boys bring 78 people. <laughs> and then after the preaching, 70, 80% of them raise their hand, you know, and uh, accept Christ. And, uh, and, and before that, um, and uh, the next year we went there, they know us already, right? So, uh, these 250 people came. <laughs> <laughs> and like, oh, traffic jam. <laughs> and, and I told my team, we have no, we have no way we can, we can stay here to have a meeting. Let's go to the street. My wife said, can I? <laughs> Legal. I said, don't care about the problem. Let's do it first la, before, before police come, okay? We do it on the, street, on the road, on the street. Of course, it's not the main road, but the, the branch of the road, you know? And then uh, as we do the presentation, you know, with our clown, I need to say, stop, 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 stop. Car coming, car coming like that. <laughs> Four or five times like that. At the end of the show, out of 250 people, around 200 people raise up their hand, you know, to accept Christ. Praise the Lord. This is Gypsy. They, they, they welcome, you know, visitors because nobody likes to visit them. They are abundant, yeah? The society do not want them. They are abundant, but God wants them. Amen? Yeah, this is scenario. You can see that they are very responsive to the gospel, Okay? Uh, we went to one village, uh, 250 people came again. Uh, we just go round, go round, and then they follow us, you know, and come for our show. Uh, they are very open hearted. Uh, this is our first gypsy with a master's degree and also a bachelor's degree. Uh, things have become better, you know. Uh, we, we helped them to set up stores, you know, and uh, raise some geese and for uh, the standard school. Uh, we do have money for that. And uh, uh, also, the, the, the next opportunity is. Um, we are able to supply uh, help to those refugees. Yeah? There are a lot of refugees around those few years before COVID. Yeah? Pakistani, Afghanistan, you know, Iranian. You know. Uh, this is a place to stay, those refugees. Uh, it's very you know, outcast kind of place. You know. uh, the police wouldn't like them to stay there. You know what happened? Yeah, this is a well, they drink water, and the policemen would dump the rubbish into the well. Okay? So they wouldn't allow them to drink so this is the, 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 the trauma they've been going through. I tell you that you know, we have so many stories that come from Germany, how the, the M group people went to church and been baptized there. And the pastor don't know why. He said, why? The 2,000 miles, 1,500 miles a kilometer we went through, we met all the Christians who helped us. That's why their heart melted, you know. And when they reached out their destination in Germany, they went to church. Amen for that? Yep. And uh, uh, we prepare some food for them. Uh, even some Iranian, you know, there are a lot of Iranian conversion there, happening there. And lastly, give me just two minutes. Uh, in Europe, uh, uh, we, we, we work among the Ukrainian refugees. I went to Poland and met up with them and then uh, see how we're doing and having to face uh, with the persecution, you know, and, and a war problem. And Moldova, a country you never know what, where is it, find a map, yeah? And the, the co-workers were helping uh, Ukrainian pastors and uh, how the, the ladies, you know, uh, received our help uh, in tears, you know. And this family received our help in the morning, and it went away, fully away in, in the afternoon, 
their house got bombed, you know, just a few hours, and their life was safe. And uh, early in December, uh, we are going to Britain, we bring the gospel back to the British. You can imagine the Hong Kong Cantonese speakers, Chinese speakers sing Silent Night, Holy Night <laughs> to the British. <laughs> Fantastic, right? So we adapted to Hudson Taylor, we go to his hometown, his own church, you know, we, we have musical and uh, we do, we do uh, last year we went to Cambridge and we're going back to Bansley to Hudson Taylor's hometown again. Lastly, let's read together. One, two, go. Earn all you can. Save all you can and give all you can. Really, we thank God that we can earn all you can, save all you can, but don't forget to give all you can. Amen for that? Now let's stand together. Let's ask God to give us the strength and give us the liberty and give us a freedom to be say, to say God, here and I, Lord. And, and help us to be available, to be participants, able to participate in His end time mission. And God has given the opportunity to us. Don't miss it because you miss it, you miss a lot. Because God will give you the credits, God will remember your good works, God will remember what you have done for Him, and one day He will reward each of us you know, uh, richly. Let's raise our hand and ask God to make us available and ask God to make the melt our heart able to be able to be available for God's end time harvest. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Let's praise God. Let's pray to God. Hallelujah. Let's open our mouth to say, God, help me to be available. Help God, help us our heart to be able to be willing, Lord, to involve in the end time harvest. Hallelujah. We praise you. We thank you. Hallelujah, hallelujah, Lord. Heavenly Father, I pray that you send glad tidings members, Lord. Send them forth, Lord, to be able to be willing participant, Lord, in the end time harvest. You have given the opportunity to give us, Lord, this privilege to join in, Lord, the spiritual military force that we out from this place to reach out to many, many nations for you, Lord. We thank you, we praise you. We thank you, Lord, for giving us the opportunity, this life that we have, Lord, this time and talents and give us the gifts that we have. We thank you, we praise you as we say, Lord, we are willing, Lord, give us, Lord, the strength to go on. Give the grace to carry out your tasks, Lord, in this region, we praise you. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, we praise your name, hallelujah.